Hello everyone, welcome back to our study on the book of Acts. We are in episode 7, chapter 3, verses 1 to 26. Let's get into it. Well, we've been learning that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to empower Christians to fulfill the Great Commission. And in episode 5, Trevor introduced the idea that the Holy Spirit enabled the apostles to perform signs and wonders, miracles, as a way of getting people's attention so that they would listen to the preaching of the gospel and be given an opportunity to repent and become Christ followers. Now, the events of Pentecost were a remarkable example of this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples to declare the wonders of God in lots of different languages. And this got the attention of a large international crowd of Jews in Jerusalem. They spoke many different languages and they heard the wonders of God being declared in those languages. This got people's attention, which meant that Peter could proclaim the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, calling people to repent and be baptized. And because of this, about 3,000 people were added to the church. Then in episode 6, we learnt what this salvation led to. What was the effect on these new believers of being saved? And we learned three things, that they had new devotions, they were captivated by different things than they were before, they had new meetings, and there were also new results as well. Now, one of the results we learned was that many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And so in this episode, we come to an example of exactly that, a sign and wonder that was performed by the apostles. So let's begin by looking at the miracle itself. This is in verses 1 to 11. So if you could just pause your video, turn to the screen, um, which will ask you to read Acts 3, 1 to 11, and then answer the question that you see there. Welcome back. Let's compare notes and see whether you've come up with the same things that I have. One of the first factors that made this an attention-grabbing sign was the occasion and the location. Verse 1. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. Official prayers were held in the temple three times a day, at 9 a.m., 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and then at sundown. This was at 3 p.m. Now, at those special times of prayers, there would have been more people gathered in the temple than at other times. What about the man's disability? This is also attention grabbing because he was lame from birth. He had to be carried. He couldn't walk. And yet the miracle was that Peter raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. I'm quoting from verse 7 there. And so he leapt up, stood began to walk and entered the temple, we read, walking and leaping and praising God. Presumably this was not a quiet little event. He was doing it in a loud, excited voice. And then we read in verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then there was the man's renown. He was well known. The gate called Beautiful was the favorite entrance to the temple court. And this was where the man was led, laid daily. Did you see that in the text? To ask alms of those entering the temple. Verse 2. And since he'd been lame from birth, we assume that he had been doing this daily for a long time. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 22, we read that he was over 40 years old. So we can be sure that this had been going on most likely, very plausibly, for decades. The result was that not only did any, everyone <laughs> see him walking and praising God, but he was also recognized as the lame man who had sat begging at the Gate Beautiful for many, many years. Now we need to ask the question, and I'm going to ask you to pause your video so that you can um, discuss this. What do we learn about healing? from verses 4 to 7 
verse 12 and verse 16. What do we learn about healing? Because we want to be doing this kind of thing as well. Presumably the Holy Spirit has also empowered us to do miracles. So the first thing we learn is that Peter and John engaged with the cripple. Presumably they'd walked past this man daily for years, maybe even decades. But this time was different. Peter and John, it says here, they directed their gaze on him and they said, look at us. So presumably the Holy Spirit had got their attention and told them now's the time to engage with this cripple. Number two. The miracle was commanded, rise up and walk. That's a command in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But notice how specific that title is. Jesus was his human name. Christ, meaning anointed one, was his title, the Messiah. And then he was of Nazareth, which means that Jesus came from Nazareth. You know, Peter didn't want to leave any doubt as to who had healed the cripple. Also, when we command something in the name of Jesus, we are commanding it as Jesus' representative because it is what Jesus wants. And the miracle is done with the power and the authority that Jesus has provided. It's not coming from us. And it's not our will or desire either. Our will and desire needs to be aligned to Jesus's in the name of Jesus. Number three, verse seven records that Peter took the cripple by the right hand and raised him up. You know, have you ever wondered why Luke included that particular detail? Took him by the right hand and raised him up. I believe it means that the cripple must have believed that he would have been here, that he would be healed because he held out his right hand for Peter to help him up. He didn't fold his arms. Uh, no, he believed that this was going to happen. He had faith to believe that he would be healed. Then number four, the healing was not due to the power or the piety, the holiness of Peter and John. You see that in verse 12. And then number five, according to verse 16, faith in the name of Jesus made the man well. And this faith was through Jesus. Do you see that in the text? Through Jesus. That is, the faith came through Jesus. So I presume that both the cripple that was healed and Peter who prayed for the healing had received faith through Jesus. Jesus had given both parties the faith to believe in this healing. So I think we can safely see, folks, that this healing was an attention-grabbing miracle. We've learned something about it, but now we come back to this idea that it was an attention-grabbing miracle. In fact, Luke records in verse 11 that all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. Peter could have left things there, but he didn't. Verse 12 records that when Peter saw it, in other words, the widespread interest in this miracle, he addressed the people. Can you see the pattern? Attention grabbing miracle, which paves the way for the gospel to be preached. So now we're going to have a look at the gospel message that Peter preached. Um, because it's been deduced from Peter's sermon in chapter 2 that a gospel message includes the following ingredients. Who Jesus is, including reference to his humanity and divinity, some sort of evidence of his humanity and his divinity, comments on his death, his resurrection and his glorification, man's sin and need, and lastly, how he can be saved. So let's just take each of these in turn. First of all, who Jesus is. Jesus is a man. 
Even today he is a man. There is a man in heaven. We've already seen that Jesus, uh, beg your pardon, Peter used the title Jesus Christ of Nazareth in verse 6. He was a man. He existed. He came from an actual village called Nazareth. He had a family. He had friends. People knew him. He had clients because he was a carpenter. And so his human history and background could actually be verified. Further, Jesus was at the center of events which the people of Jerusalem had both witnessed and participated in. They were the ones who had delivered him to Pilate. They had denied him in the presence of Pilate. They had asked for a murderer to be released instead of Jesus. And in fact, Peter goes so far as to accuse them of actually killing Jesus because if they, the crowd, had relented, then Pilate would have released Jesus. Did you see that in the text? And therefore, a gospel message must include the claim that Jesus existed as a man. And this can be verified by historical evidence. Now, the historical evidence that's available, the sources in our day and age, are different to the ones that were available at the time. At the time, you could actually go and speak to witnesses. In our day and age, we have to rely on historical sources. But they are there, and they can be checked and they can be verified. But what's more, he was a man. I uh, beg your pardon. <laughs> what's more, he was God. We've learned that he was a man. Now we learn that um, he was God as well. In verse 13, Jesus is described as a servant of God. That term servant could mean servant or child of God. And you know, Jesus was not... <laughs> the, the child of some insignificant God. See how he's described here? As the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the crowd's ancestors. Their fathers, he, he, he talks about their fathers. Peter is saying, he is saying in the most unequivocal of ways, Jesus was the servant of your God, not just any God, your God. But many Jews actually believe that Jesus was the servant of Satan. That was why they killed him. But they had actually killed the servant, if not the child, of their own God. And then Peter goes on to make some remarkable claims about Jesus. He says that Jesus is the holy and righteous one. In verse 14, well, we're going to come back to that. That he was the author of life. Verse 15, I'm not going to go into it now, but there are many references in the Bible that talk about the fact that Everything came from God, but everything was created through Jesus. And then lastly, he was the Christ in verse 18. In other words, the Messiah that the crowd was waiting for. God's special messenger to mankind. And folks, the above, those three things can only be true of God. The Bible doesn't leave us any room to believe that Jesus was only a man. He was also God. So Peter was portraying Jesus as a person who was both God and man simultaneously. Now, did Peter provide any evidence of this? Just a quick qualifier. Jesus' resurrection was the biggest proof of the fact that he was both man and God. And we're going to consider this shortly. However, Peter does refer to other proofs as well. When Jesus was alive, he taught that the miracles he performed verified his claim to be the Christ, to be the Messiah. And this continued to be the case after he died, because the cripple was a case in point. He was healed in the name of Jesus. The miracles were continuing, even though Jesus had returned to heaven. So just stop your video for a moment and answer the question. Does Peter provide other proof that Jesus was the Messiah, on top of the miracles, in other words? Just have a look at verse 18. Welcome back. Let me see what I've come up with. Not only was Jesus attested to by the miracles, but also by the mouth 
of all the prophets, verse 18. Peter reminds the crowd of this and that God's Christ would suffer. As we said earlier, the Jews thought that Jesus' death was God's punishment and the ultimate proof that he was a charlatan and not the Christ. They couldn't have been more wrong and they should actually have known better. For God had foretold the suffering of Christ by the mouth of the prophets. I'm quoting directly from the text. The Jews had heard this read from the scriptures that God had given to them. Incidentally, they would have heard the scriptures read every Sabbath day in the synagogue. Although not everybody had access to, a, uh, to, to the scriptures, they heard them being read and also they were expounded and taught when they were young. Let's move on now to the next ingredient, Jesus' death, resurrection and glorification. Verse 15 refers to both the death and the resurrection. And in the same verse, Peter claims to be a witness of this. He had seen and interacted with Jesus after his resurrection. And the significance of the resurrection is that it proves that Jesus had lived a sinful life. And that's why Peter was so confident in calling him the holy and righteous one. If he had not been holy, if he had not been entirely righteous, then God would not have raised him from the dead. Jesus' glorification is mentioned in verse 13. What do we mean by the fact that Jesus was glorified? And, and there is quite a lot to this, but part of it is that he had been received into heaven. Do you see that in verse 21? Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So he's been received into heaven. And the fact that he's been received into heaven means that in raising him from the dead, God gave him a resurrection body. You can't go to heaven with these kinds of bodies, the kind of body that Jesus had. He was given a resurrection body. And it was a glorified body. In the sense that one day we too will be glorified and receive this glorious resurrection body that is never going to perish, nor is it going to tempt us to sin. Isn't that something to look forward to? No aging, no temptation to sin. Also, talking about Jesus' glorification here, we read in Ephesians 1 verse 20 that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet. This is the, this is the God. This is the Jesus that we are proclaiming in our gospel message. And he is glorious. Wouldn't you say that that is a, a glorious position to be in? Authority, power, dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Put all things under his feet. Next ingredient of the gospel message is man's sin and need. And so once again, if you would just pause, uh, have a look at your screen, read what's what you need to and discuss do you notice or did you notice that peter doesn't allow the crowd to shift the blame onto their leaders. We, we are very good as human beings at blame shifting. But he makes it clear. He says, you acted in ignorance. It's quite adversarial here. And then he adds, as also did your rulers. It was the crowd who had asked for a murderer to be released in the place of Jesus, verse 14. Also in verse 19, Peter calls on the crowd to repent which shows that acting in ignorance is still a sin. 
Was their ignorance justified? Well, Peter clearly thinks not. They should have known better because of the prophecies in Scripture, which they had heard, read every Sabbath day and which they had studied from childhood. Peter gives the prophecy of Moses as a case in point, and he chose Moses because he was the prophets most respected by the Jews. They would have heard this particular prophecy. But then Peter also says that all the prophets, <laughs> in verse 24, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who come after him also proclaimed these days. Once again, um, I feel sorry for the person with the remote. They'll be doing lots of work. Please pause the video. Um, read what Moses said in verses 22 to 23, and then just answer the questions there on the screen from, from the text. So welcome back. Let, let's compare notes again. We learn that the Messiah would be raised up, raised up in the sense that he would be prepared and sent by God, and, and he would be raised up by the Lord God. Did you see that? The Messiah would be raised up by the Lord God. The miracles of Jesus and those that were done in his name attested that he had actually been raised and prepared and sent by God. We also learn that the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses from your brothers. In other words, he would be a Jew and he would be human. Once again, more evidence that, that he was human. Moses commanded the Israelites to listen to him in whatever he tells you. And then he said, and every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. We could say that the person will be removed from God's chosen people through their destruction. Now, now that we've answered the questions, um, I have some more surprise, surprise um, that relate to verses 25 and 26. So once again, pause your video. Welcome back. All the families on earth would be blessed in Jesus. This means that the work that Jesus did on the cross was for all mankind and not just for the Jews. God that sent the Messiah to the Jews first because he had been promised under the covenant that God made with the Jewish people. And then God made a new covenant in which people from all people groups could participate, all the nations of the earth. Messiah was to bring a blessing to people under both covenants. What was the blessing? Namely, to turn them away from their wickedness. If you could pause your video, just answer the two questions. What was the wickedness of the crowd? And have people today committed the same sin? Well, let's, let's answer those two questions. The crowd were responsible for two things. Number one, for not listening to the Messiah. And number two, for killing him instead. Now, we need to give that second question. Have people committed the same sin today? Some careful thought. Because people today would not have the same sense of being God's chosen people of being in a covenant with him, of, ha of having scriptures inspired by him. However, Paul teaches in Romans 1 that creation, what we see around us, bears testimony to the power and the nature of God. I mean, you cannot but look at creation without thinking there has to be a God. And he is 
powerful. He is amazing. And that should motivate people to seek God and find out what He wants from them. And surely in our context, there is actually more than enough for people to explore. Bibles are readily available, churches abound, and so on and so forth. But instead, rather than being responding in that way, people go their own way. They actually go against, they, Paul says, they suppress the truth. They determine for themselves what is right and wrong, and they ignore God. And this, this rebellion, and we've all participated in it, folks, is responsible for the evil that we see in the world. We've all contributed to it. And it was to put this right that Jesus died voluntarily to put it right, to clean up the mess. So in a sense, we are all responsible for Christ's death. And you could explain it in those terms to people that you are presenting the gospel to. And this brings us to the last ingredient of Peter's message, how man's need can be met. And basically the big idea here is that man's need can be met through repentance. So read verses 19 to 21. Um, try and find out uh, what it is. What is repentance according, according to verse 19? And what are the three results or the three effects of repentance? So welcome back. Let's just answer those last um, two questions. To repent, according to the text, is to turn back. To turn back to what? To God's Messiah. And turning to God's Messiah means listening to and obeying what he says. Just remember the effects that it had on those new converts. We looked at it in the last episode. Remember the new devotions, the new meetings, and so on and so forth. Turning to Jesus, turning back to Jesus means trusting Jesus to save you from God's destruction, just as the cripple put his faith in Jesus for healing. The cripple was like, I've got a problem. I need healing. I need to be saved. Put his faith in Jesus. We are the same. We have a problem. We have a need. We need to put our faith in Jesus. We need to turn away from the way that we were doing things to the way that Jesus wants us to do things. We need to turn to Jesus to put our faith and trust in Jesus and who he said he was. What about the effects of repentance? It really would be productive to, to just meditate on these things a little bit more than we can in the space of this particular presentation. So what are the three effects? Our sins will be blotted out. <laughs> You know, when writing has been blotted out, it cannot be read. Your sins can no longer be read. They've been blotted out. They're gone. Times of refreshing. Oh, isn't that something that we all need? We all need to be refreshed. We all need to be rejuvenated. That This talks about bringing life. Times of refreshing. And then the one that I love the most. I don't know. Actually, I love them all. But I just love the fact that one of the results of repentance is that it, it brings the presence of Jesus. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is for. That's why we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit brings the presence of Jesus right into the very center of our beings so that we can love Him, so that we can commune with Him, so that we can be refreshed by Him, so that we can be encouraged by Him. So folks, great session. I've been so enjoying this. I've been encouraging myself even as I've been talking about these things. We said that the purpose of miracles is to get people's attention so that they will listen to the gospel message. And I believe that God still wants to do miracles today. And he doesn't just want to do it in church. And he doesn't want to just do it for Christians. He wants to do it for non-Christians to get their attention. And that's, we should be asking God for opportunities to put our faith and our trust in Him. Saying, Holy Spirit, lead me. 
guide me, show me when to engage, just as Peter and John did as they walked past that cripple in the gate, beautiful. And then we share the gospel message to convince people of who Jesus is. So we do the miracle so that they'll listen to the gospel message because after all, some sort of physical healing is only going to last for a lifetime. It's not going to last for eternity. We need to preach the gospel so the person can be saved for eternity. Share the gospel message to convince the people of who Jesus is, of their sin because of the way that they've treated him, and lastly, of their need for repentance. And to do this, we include the ingredients that we've just talked about. Who is Jesus, his humanity and his divinity? That there is evidence of the above. We need to talk about Jesus' death, resurrection and glorification, man's need, and how he can be saved. Folks, I trust that this has been a blessing for you. And I'm going to be praying that God might do some, some miracles. They might not be on the same scale as this, but certainly the, well, I hope they are. Um, but they might not be. And, uh, but we just want them because it, it, it's a way of getting people's attention and giving us an opportunity, opening the door for them to hear the gospel and put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Goodbye for now. And I look forward being, to being <laughs> with you again um, sometime soon.